We're a small regional college, a public institution, open enrollment. Uh, we have a variety of undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Uh, sitting here, um, we have a, a very good cross-section of our administration. Uh, my name is Don King. I am the chair of the teacher education program. Within our department, we have elementary ed, early childhood, middle grades education, and secondary education, as well as a number of graduate. I'm Susan Hines. I'm an associate vice president for um, teaching and learning technologies, and I oversee the library and the teaching and learning center. I'm Charles Snare, and I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Shedden State College. Uh, my name is Margaret Krauss, and I am one of the academic deans uh, at the institution. And I am responsible for the education program, mm -hmm. the counseling, psychology, social work, and health education programs. What we did at Shedden State, the elementary education faculty wanted to reduce the cost of materials to the students, in other words, the textbook costs. And in part because the students have to pay a great deal of money for the testing to get certified. So what they were looking for were online courses that they could make no cost to the student other than their tuition and fees for uh, getting credit for the course. And so that was what started the program. Then we worked with designers and the librarians with the instructional designer and with a student researcher to help get the low cost, no cost materials into their uh, courses. So it was a team of people who developed the uh, courses. The content person was the faculty and then we had other people to help them get the things. Well, we got started in this, let's see, back in 2011 because we were one of the participants in a Kale the Kaleidoscope grant that was funded by Lumen and Gate, or, uh, Gates, Gates, Gates Foundation, Foundation and, and Hewlett, Hewlett, Hewlett and Gates. And uh, that was, we were with seven other institutions that decided to collaborate together to produce um, o OER in, in various courses. And then in turn, after that grant was up, we got the follow-on grant that enlarged it to, I think, about 25 institutions uh, that were all pursuing, in, in the general education area, uh, OER courses. Uh, the reason Shadron State got involved in it, uh, from my perspective, is the most important part is, is the collaboration. And I think that was illustrated this morning in the uh, opening session, where he talked about that the uh, productivity, the things that uh, you gain out of that in collaborating, just it moves everybody along. It uh, leads to innovation that can't happen otherwise, and that was a huge part. Uh, a second part was was obviously the cost. I mean that is important to students. I mean Don, I think talked about that earlier today, where uh, some students just either it's going to take them longer or they just don't attend. Uh, is a significant, significant factor. And then um, just in higher ed education in general, at least in the United States, there is an immense amount of pressure to, uh, be for, to be affordable. And this is one concrete way to do that. And uh, so we pursued that and in the process then other things started coming into play that uh, that really involved the rest of them. It even goes beyond that to some extent because often if something comes down from administration, it, the, first an, the first response is no, whether it is positive or negative. And since we work in an environment where, um, well, there's faculty unions and shared governance, uh, what, what becomes critical in, in my view and, and part of what leadership is about is finding out what people want to do and where they want to go. And that's important because when you talk to a faculty member or staff member and you ask them why they're in higher education, they will say they're there because of student learning. So I think one of the advantages that higher education actually has is we, we're all here with the same goal. <laughs> I think sometimes we forget about that. 
and just remind when, when you remind people or in some cases ask them where they want to go 80 percent of the time it's where everyone else wants to go anyways and so some of these things well like the quality matters where we had uh, like four or five faculty that, that got interested in that is that we supported that to see where it would go and if it's good other people will use it if it's not good you don't want the whole campus using it anyways because it becomes a, a waste of resources so uh, that part from my view is, is looking at where faculty are going supporting the things that you know will help the institution and uh, channeling uh, people's time and effort in that direction it's not that you don't have setbacks in fact I would tell you with the OER we've moved forward in a lot of ways in other ways we've taken a step backwards um, but that's okay uh, sometimes that's what you do when you're climbing mountains you scale up a plateau and come back down because you realize you've got to go a different direction I think that it was more than just a test it was more than just a trial run in that uh, faculty within the teacher education program who were eager became committed because you we all realized that the effort and the amount of resources and time etc that we would have to put into the process um, you either had to be committed or it just wasn't worth it so we really embraced it entirely and decided to move forward with it as a program now institutionally that depends. We have the autonomy as, an, as a, um, an education department or program to oversee and determine the method of delivery for our courses. So within ed, we were committed. It was not a trial. It might have appeared to be a trial <laughs> for the rest of the campus, but um, there have been some stumbling blocks just with regard to time and other work commitments, but I think we're still moving forward. I think what's critical from my standpoint, you've got the chair of the department, you have the dean of the school, you have, in this case, the associate vice president that, that deals with the, the library and technology. You have three key components, individuals that are high quality and committed. And to me, that's being in the position I'm in. This is a no-brainer. <laughs> I mean, you just follow and you support the ways you can support. I actually oversee um, two key areas, the library and the teaching and learning center where our instructional designer is housed. And our librarian has been very instrumental. We have a librarian who's specializing in OER. And basic, our process works like this. We engage students to help us with the research part. That research is vetted by a librarian who then turns over uh, a lot of the OERs to the faculty member. Are these graduate students? Or no. Undergraduate. Undergraduate students, usually in education, usually someone who's taken the course that's being developed. Um, so we try to give the faculty member as much support in finding high quality materials in, that are that have CC licensing and or in the public domain. And that gives them a head start in terms of uh, they don't have to do all that searching themselves and and then we also provide an instructional designer and a technician who helps them install the course into the LMS because my goal is not to make faculty members technicians or researchers I really want them to be teachers I want them to focus on having great assignments for students and to put their energies there rather than having to think about all of these other things ADA compliance, copyright permissions. We want other people to take care of that so they can really focus. There's more to it than I think we had some people present on that today. Our instructional designer and librarian was here today also presenting with one of the education faculty. And I think people walked away from that thinking, well, there's a lot of moving parts in that process. But I agree with you that OER and online, they're naturals together. From a departmental level, um, it was there was no challenge with regard to the initial interest of faculty but those faculty were in different programs so the challenge was 
to get faculty within the same program to agree and identify the goal of opening or establishing an online degree pathway that was open ed. And once we got that commitment from our faculty, and that took a lot of discussion at department meetings because that was something the department needed to agree on, um, then we were able to move forward. The second hurdle is the element of time. I don't think that it's fully understood the extent of the time commitment that it takes on top of your regular teaching and instruction and faculty um, responsibilities. There was a financial incentive that was offered um, in order to develop the course. And other than that, um, the opportunity to experience it, um, be a part of the research process, the design process, um, those were perks, but not financial rewards. No, we, we chose to um, have full commitment by the faculty. Uh, there were a couple of faculty members that were hesitant for a variety of reasons, and some for good reasons. Um, but those individuals um, are not teaching within the elementary education program, so it has not been um, a problem. It has not been problematic for that pathway. From a supervising dean standpoint, um, there, I had two things happen. I had, I had a group of elementary education faculty under the leadership of their department chair who wanted to go to do a program. Then I had another set of faculty who were, I would call it a little bit rogue. They wanted to do o OER. Uh, they wanted to do it a little bit differently than the elementary education groupie wanted to do it. And um, so what I, I found myself in a position, I've got one group that wants to approach it this way. I have another group who wants to approach it another way. I encouraged both of them. The only thing in the rogue group was that I needed to make sure they didn't go outside the parameters of what's acceptable at Shadron State College. Um, you know, there are certain platforms you can use, certain mm -hmm. platforms you can't use. And um, so I just had to pay more attention to what they were doing. But basically, my job was just encouragement. Um, I guess my job is when, when I, so I've only been at Shadron for a little over a year. So when I came in, it was largely to, there were some random acts of progress, but what we, we had courses in lots of different disciplines, but no unifying thread. And my background is in putting online programs together, and the way we always tackled that was to get whole, whole programs on board, because once you get a whole program on board, 12, 18 courses go online relatively quickly. So it's the same approach for OER and online because we're doing them at the same time. So if you can get a whole department to commit that, and, and you can start to look at something programmatically. For example, if you've been in the United States for a while, you may have heard this figure. Students get out of our colleges at the bachelor's level here with 30, on average $30,000 worth of debt. Um, so in order to reduce the debt, so Elementary education with their textbook numbers right now, if they were completely OER or no no textbook costs, they could have reduced the debt by six thousand dollars. Now, that means you're just twenty four thousand dollars in debt, but it's a lot less than thirty. So there are things that faculty can control to keep the cost down. I think Margaret mentioned that in education they have some high testing fees that they have to pay. This would help to offset that. And we we're in a fairly rural, poor region of the country, so every little bit helps. So when you tackle things programmatically, it's not just that you've saved $100 on a textbook here, it's you've saved $6,000 in your program, so that the numbers add up. And then there's also just cohesiveness and camaraderie in, in getting it done. And people are also understanding that they can't build these idiosyncratic courses that only they can use. There's a sense of a scalable course that you can hand off to a colleague, or if your program grows, you can continue to hand off and, and scale it up. So 
part of my responsibility really was to get this kind of cohesive approach and then build the support network, the librarian, the instructional designer, the, the e-scribes, this process. And we only have one who serves the entire school, and that's not, that's actually not unusual. They have several online programs at the graduate and undergraduate level, but elementary education was not an online program. They're going online and OER at the same time, which is really kind of a natural. I actually think they're more positive about the OER than they are about the online. Mm -hmm. Yes, that they are. Yeah. So, you know, um, they, they love the idea of saving 3,000 students. And approximately 1,000 of those, am I correct, are online. Most of the online are in the business program, the graduate programs, in a psychology program, and a math program. They're all degree. All degree mm -hmm. Well, primarily they're all degree. We have a lot of um, teachers who are teaching in the field, sorry, who come back to take courses, continuing ed courses, in order to keep their teacher certification. The challenges are, I actually really, I think their time, but also, um, yeah, I guess keeping momentum. People. People need, I think people, when they, when they get over a certain hump, they go, I've done it, I'm happy. And, and they feel like they can go into the next project or somebody can see them finish and feel like, okay, it's not that bad, it's just a semester. Uh, I've, been a, I've been an instructional designer. I can usually tell you people are unhappy when they design courses and they're extremely happy about five months later when they actually teach the course and they've really done some due diligence in thinking about its design and they're pretty happy when they finally teach it. But, you know, that's a, it's a fairly delayed celebration. So figuring out ways to keep the momentum. And well, we, we had, uh, oh, I think it was a couple of years ago, we had some library consultants come in, uh, three of them, and, and to do an analysis of the library. And it was a 50-page a report that I think identified two positive aspects. And you know, out of that, uh, we had, we, we brought in a couple more consultants, including Susan, to, to take a look at things with regards to the library and other units to get more of an external, you know, how the library was relating to the rest of the institution. And out of that came then uh, trying to think of, of ways to reconfigure things. And in my conversations and the feedback I got from talking to other libraries that uh, for an institution our size, that uh, pulling together the, the library with the Teaching and Learning Center uh, might be an alternative. Now the, the one uh, huge missing piece for us was is that we lacked someone of Susan's knowledge to be able to come in and pull that together because we just didn't have the knowledge in place to do that. So it was identifying an area that we had a deficit in to do that. So out of that then came uh, basically what uh, Susan has now built is, is, is that resource center that uh, looks very, very different from before, but um, has helped us overcome a problem too. I mean, I, I sat for four hours at the end of when the when the library consultants came in, and each of them told me it would it would take us two years to dig out of this very deep deep hole, and within two years now we're in the new media consortium library edition of being on the innovative edge. Well, and and I would attribute the success to all three of these people here because you have to have someone like Susan come in to be able to do that. You have to have a dean in place that, and Margaret came in at a critical point where we were shifting some things because of in some internal challenges that kept things moving forward. And then Don coming in to uh, work with a department that uh, had some people that were skeptical, and which is good. I mean, that's how we're trained. I see a lot of my job is is trying to uh, find 
the people that are forward thinking, in, in this case like these three individuals, people that are willing to go the extra mile, uh, and then trying to put in place either uh, the right people uh, to, uh, I mean, we tried to get to the right people in the library uh, or in other places so that uh, really the individuals that make things happen can make it happen. Um, so they do all the work. I I, I think if we are very systematic about how we approach the development of our courses online using OER, that we will uh, have better learning outcomes. Our outcomes will be much more um, authentic uh, related to, I think we'll think more about making the outcome authentic so that the individual understands why they are doing what they are doing and where it's going to lead them. Yeah. It has relevancy. Mm -hmm. To give it more relevancy. And I think what does that is, is really thinking about how do I put these things together and I'm not following a book. I'm not following a textbook on how to teach algebra. I have to find what I think we need to know about algebra and develop the outcomes and then find the resources that fit that outcome and the authentic assessment that will support it. So I think that uh, online and OER do, do have the ability to improve our learning outcomes for our students, from my point of view. In addition to improving the learning outcomes, I really believe that the process has allowed us the opportunity to ensure that we are actually meeting our learning outcomes and assessing them. One thing to have them listed and even in the syllabus, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're appropriately teaching and assessing to those outcomes. I'll give you an example of something very simple um, our instructional designer did recently in her design strategy for assignments. Um, she now for the so that the student understands what role this assignment serves in the overarching scheme of outcomes. She now links that outcome back to the unit outcome, the course outcome, so the student really understands, oh, this is what this assignment is designed to do. But it doesn't just do that for the student, too. It does it for the instructor as well. And then sometimes they see a misalignment or, oh, that assignment doesn't really do that. I need to tweak the assignment or I need to tweak the outcome. So that's a very simple thing to do in design, but it's an often missed piece. You don't need, do you need a reason to write an essay? <laughs> <laughs>
that um, you know we take their concerns uh, being serious. We're we're saving you know their son or daughter money uh, to get back some of the goodwill that I think we've actually lost. Well, probably the most well-known book here is Academic Adrift, and then there's a, a subsequent uh, book that they have just published quality end of things and, and, and really very uh, skeptical anymore that a large number of students you know, go through four years of college and uh, at least according to some reports that you know uh, almost uh, you know not quite 50 percent have actually learned very very little so you know this is a way as Don is, is talking about to be very transparent to, for people to, uh, they can look at the stuff, they can see what we're doing, um, and and makes it more accountable. The other cost aspect to this, and, and Susan talked about the scalability, but I guess I take a, I can take a little bit different twist on that, and and that is, you know, right now the model is is, is a professor goes in and they reinvent the wheel for the thousandth time, you know, when you're teaching intro to psychology that's been taught for 40 years by thousands and thousands of professors and everyone starting from scratch. So, for instance, in what, ed what education is actually doing now is that whoever comes, whoever follows Don in is not going to start from scratch. I mean, it, it's much more, in some ways, a research-built model because like in research, you build on the shoulders of other people, and that's what we're doing with this, so that when people come in, they're not starting at ground level. It doesn't mean they're going to be out of a job, because there's always going to be those, those teaching puzzles out there that are going to need to be solved and have more time to find out where the obstacles are. So what this means is, is we're becoming much more cost effective and getting more for what we're actually doing, uh, rather than being something that is uh, kind of haphazard in many ways.